St. Louis, 1834. On a pleasant springtime morning, a group of 60 young men are busy readying themselves to head up the Missouri River. To a man, their goal in the ensuing months is to make as much money as possible. To do this, they have all signed on as hired hands to the fur expedition of one Mr. Wyeth, a Yankee entrepreneur that sought to solidify his own fortune via the accrual and sale of one of the most valuable resources on the North American continent at the time, beaver pelts. The parlors and cafes of such faraway locales as New York City, London, and Paris were full of men sporting one of the most defining fashion developments of the 19th century, the beaver felt top hat. This fashion craze caused the demand for beaver pelts to skyrocket, and many young men to head west with intentions of securing their own fortunes. This group of prospective trappers, now gathered in St. Louis, are mostly in their late teens and early 20s, with many having made their way to the frontier port city from home states such as New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Most were, to say the least, serviceable woodsmen, but few had ever ventured into the territory they were now about to. The nervous tension of youngsters on the brink of great adventure and great danger prevailed amongst them, as they were all too aware of the potential risks and rewards of their new endeavor. In the preceding weeks, as they had waited for the company of Mr. Wyeth to assemble and fully outfit itself, the neophyte frontiersmen had watched as many a keelboat had pulled into St. Louis bearing the fruits of their passengers' labors. Vast quantities of seemingly flawless beaver pelts were unloaded by weary but satisfied trappers, returning to sell their wares for profit and finally take their leave from the field. However, along with their encouraging bounties, the returning trappers also brought back with them no short supply of hair-raising stories about their run-ins with the tribes upon whose territories their trade required them to encroach. Oftentimes, trappers and frontiersmen were able to broker peaceable agreements with local tribes, with many becoming adopted into or intermarrying with a number of different tribes like the Crow, the Shoshone, and the Mandan. The Blackfoot, however, had proven perpetually combative and unreceptive to treaty, trade, or coexistence. The Blackfoot as a people are actually composed of four closely related bands. These are the Northern Pigan, the Southern Pigan, the Blood or Kaina, and the Siksika, often referred to as the Northern Blackfoot. Their reach by the early 19th century was vast, stretching from northern present-day Alberta, Canada to southern Montana. They had originally come from the east, being one of the first Algonquin language-speaking tribes to migrate westward in order to hunt the vast herds of buffalo upon the open plains. Up until the early 18th century, they had subsisted by hunting the buffalo on foot. They would burn large swaths of prairie in predetermined locations, knowing the smoke and flames would cause whole herds of the lumbering beasts to panic and stampede, upon which they could be run off of cliffs where they would fall to their deaths. Sometime before 1750, however, the Blackfoot had acquired both horses and firearms, and they had used these new technologies to not only revolutionize their approach to hunting, but their approach to warfare. Now heavily armed and highly mobile, the Blackfoot waged merciless war on their longtime enemies like the Cree, the Crow, and the Kootenai. They saw the trapping expeditions who trapped and skinned the plentiful beavers from their lakes and streams and harvested and fed upon their deer, elk, and bear as no more than bald-faced intruders deserving of neither merit nor mercy. Many a young man newly arrived to St. Louis would find their taste for the freedom and adventure of the wild frontier suddenly soured upon hearing a returning trapper recount tales of finding good friends and comrades' bodies, terribly mutilated and full of so many arrows they resembled dead porcupines. But despite all of the dangers, or maybe because of them, the prevailing mood on this morning is one of joviality and optimism. As the young men stand around in small groups, seeking shade as the sun begins its climb to its noontime apex, they trade stories of wild nights on the town, 
boast of great deeds yet undone, and rib each other with jokes. One among them, though, is notably less enthusiastic. Though outwardly looking as fit for the job as any of his cohorts to his left and right, a young man known only to history as Howell takes little to no part in the fun. He has, in fact, proven so sullen and melancholy over the last few days, many of the others wonder if he will even board the boat heading west on the Missouri, or whether he will head back home, wherever that might be. His perceived weakness draws the ire of his companions, as is wont to happen in groups of men such as this, when it is seen as more of a merciful fate for all involved to run the weak member out, lest he become a liability for all at some later date in some far less hospitable locale. Howell himself wonders what he will do when the boat scheduled to take them upstream arrives. He had eaten little in the past few days, and slept even less. This combination serves only to fray his already strained nerves even further, as his mind drifts and his resolve continues to waver. Time, however, waits for no one, and before noon, the boat has docked only yards away from where the men of the company are waiting. The next few hours are spent loading the men, livestock, and material meant to sustain them for several months onto the boat. Finally, with all sixty of the men, including Howell, plus the crew and Mr. Wyeth aboard, the keelboat departs St. Louis, heading up the river towards the frontier. After a few days' travel on the river, the company pulls ashore to make camp. After securing the livestock and eating a much-anticipated supper, the trappers convene in small circles around several small campfires. As each group settles in about the fire, conversation is made about the day's events and expectations of what is to come. Still, Howell remains as distant and melancholy as ever. His compatriots, not lacking entirely in basic empathy, at least not yet, inquire as to what the cause of Howell's seemingly incessant internal turmoil might be. Howell, exhausted by the physical and psychological toll of the day, confesses almost immediately, with equal parts relief and anxiety, that the source of his trouble is the ceaseless worry and heart sickness caused by the beautiful young woman he had left behind. The following is an excerpt from Four Years in the Rockies by James P. Marsh link to purchase in the description. Well, boys, Howell said, I suppose you think it's strange that I should always be so gloomy, but I have good reasons for being so. I believe I am today the most unlucky man in the world. Listen, and you can judge for yourselves. I was engaged to be married to one of the nicest girls in St. Louis, and she was just as good as she was good-looking. She was a seamstress and supported herself and her aged mother by sewing for a clothing store. We were engaged last spring and were to marry in the fall, and in the meantime, I was to save up enough money to buy a wagon and a team and go hauling. Well, boys, I shipped on board a steamboat as a deckhand at $30 a month, and I afterwards become a fireman, for which I received $40 a month. I was saving and by the middle of September had $200 with which I started up to St. Louis. Near Memphis, our boat blew up. There were a great many killed and scalded. I was knocked overboard and picked up in an insensible condition. When I came to, I found myself in bed. My money was gone, and I never heard of it again, and I went back to St. Louis poorer than when I left. My girl received me kindly and bade me of good cheer, but our wedding was postponed till spring, and I hired with a tanner in St. Charles at $25 a month. I understood the business and made a good deal by working extra time, and by February I had a hundred extra dollars saved, which I left in the hands of my employer. Well, gentlemen, one night the whole concern burned down, and as there was no insurance, my boss was a ruined man, and so was I, and having now lost all heart, contrary to the wishes of my girl, I joined Wyeth's company, and here I am. Yes, and you have me to thank for it, chided a man in the company known only as Smith, whom Mr. Wyatt had bailed out of jail with a promise to the local sheriff that his employment would prevent any further rabble-rousing in his town. Smith, a callous and uncaring man by all accounts, then recalled in front of all at the campfire 
how Howell had attempted to take his traps and desert when the boat had docked briefly in St. Charles. Just before reaching St. Charles, Howell had concluded that he would not, or could not, continue on the trip and determined to head back to St. Louis. He had quietly gathered his traps and, in a moment when all of the rest of the crew were busy on board or engaged elsewhere, attempted to slip off the boat and into the small crowd, leaving no one the wiser as to his whereabouts. However, Smith had spotted Howell packing his things and knew the obvious cause was that of his great anxiety to return to his bride-to-be. Disgusted, Smith berated Howell with insults, telling him not to be such a lovesick baby and to remember the agreement that he had made with the company, one which he was honor-bound as a man, to uphold. For a few minutes, Smith and Howell argued in hushed tones, with each becoming more vehement in their position. Finally, just as the boat began to pull away from the shore, Howell jumped off the vessel and onto the shore, determined to make his escape. Smith demanded the keelboat pilot return the vessel to the banks of the river so that he might retrieve Powell. At first, the pilot refused. But he was quickly persuaded when Smith pulled out a revolver and stuck it against the pilot's head. Smith demanded the boat be brought to shore immediately or he would dispatch the pilot right here and now. As the boat pulled close enough to shore, Smith jumped off, promptly walked up to Howell, grabbed him by the arm and forcibly dragged him back to the boat, all while verbally shaming him for his lapse in manly virtue. Devastated and terrified, Howell now saw that his fate was sealed, and ever since, he had spent every night tossing and turning at the prospect that he might now never see his beloved again. Now, as the flickering campfire illuminated Howell's forlorn and desperate expression, one of the few older men in the company, a man named Green, seeking to show at least some measure of commiseration with the poor young man, smiles knowingly and reaches into his pocket, from which he procures a piece of hammered gold, again quoting from Four Years in the Rockies. Do you see that, boys? said Green. That's what started me for the Rockies. That was once an engagement ring. Yes, boys, it's a fact. I was once engaged to be married, and the gal was pretty as a peach and spry as a bird, and she thought a heap of me, she did. But I, like a darn fool, got on a bender for three or four days, and when she heard on it, she sent me back this ring. Well, boys, I took it and hammered it out the way you see it now. Wyeth was just getting up his company at that time, and so I joined. Another trapper by the name of Rube, now moved by the other's stories and seeking to both share in his cohort's burden and relieve himself of his own, spontaneously chimes in with his own story. See here, boys. You seem to all be in for telling what started you to the Rockies. Now, what do you suppose started me? Now, you can believe it or believe it not, just as you please, but honest engine, it were a cussed old mule. Though, mind you, there were a gal involved, too. You may talk about your pretty gals and your spry gals. There weren't a patchin' in Selena Perkins. She weighed 160 pounds and had a face on her around like a full moon. She was a rouser, she was. Well, we were engaged to be married, and I were to run her daddy's farm, which were about nine miles from St. Louis. This day before the wedding, I went into town to buy a critter and fell in with some of my old pards, who were out of the Rockies with me the year before. Well, I began to feel like taking another trip, but I couldn't see how this thing was to be did. There were the gal, and the wedding were to come off the next night, so I thought I'd take a night to consider on it. The next morning I bought a mule I had been looking at the day before, and after running around with the boys all day, towards night I started for home, and would you believe it, I hadn't made up my mind whether to marry or to start for the Rockies. The company would be off the next morning, and as I rid along on the mule I kept studying but I couldn't come to no conclusion. About eight miles from St. Louis, the roads forked. One road led to my gals and t'other to town. Just before I reached the forks, a happy idea struck me. By thunder, says I, I'll leave it to the mule. If she takes the right-handed road, it's Mary. If she takes the left, it's the Rockies. So I dropped her bridle into her neck, stuck my hands into my pockets and said, go it, Bets, for that were her name. Well, boys, she took the left, and here I am. I writ Selena a letter telling her to hold on faithful for two years. I'd be on them with pockets full of dollars, and we'd hitch for sure and certain without fail. For a brief moment, 
The all-too-rare compassion of his fellow trappers gives Howell a much-needed measure of relief. He realizes he is not alone in his suffering, and he is with friends. Howell takes heart in this, thinking maybe things are not so bad after all. He sleeps peacefully for the first time in many days. Then, the next morning, the call goes out to load up, for the company is taking the boat to its final point, as far into the frontier as they can be taken with some relative measure of safety. Now, a cold chill goes down Howell's spine, as he is reminded that they are headed into dangerous territory, ruled over by dangerous tribes who had no interest in extending compassion of any kind. The Blackfoot do not care about Howell's homesickness, nor his heartache, nor that of any of his cohorts. They do not care why these men have come to their lands, only that they are here, and that they are trespassing. However, despite the hazards of their endeavor, there is still much work for the trappers to do. The company departs the relative safety of the Missouri River and makes their way onto the prairies and foothills. For weeks, they work from stream to stream, river to river, going out in small groups in the early morning to set traps and returning to check on them periodically throughout the next few days. Though many meet with initial success, they are also quickly fatigued by the incessant danger and intermittent attacks of the Blackfoot. The trappers play an ongoing game of chance, in which they must balance risk and reward every day, constantly evaluating and recalculating their odds and decisions. The more trappers that went out in a group, the more protection could be afforded against Blackfoot attacks. However, this also meant the bounty of pelts would have to be divvied up into smaller shares. This could net the trapper such little gain for such risk that risking a little more to gain a little more could fast become an enticing prospect. It was this ongoing gamble that eventually begins to play on the mind of Howell. Over the ensuing weeks, he and his companions have worked hard and endured much privation and danger. They have also, they are now confident, learned how to stay alive in harsh territory. Now, many of them see that they can perhaps count on their newfound sense of self-sufficiency to garner them the fortunes that they seek. Howell decides the risk is worth the reward, as does Green, the man who carries the piece of gold in his pocket. When the company reaches the area of the Yellowstone River, two men set out down its banks intending to set traps for the next few miles. All seems well as the country is beautiful, the day is warm, and signs of beaver in the area are plentiful. For a brief moment, perhaps it seems to both men as if things are not so bad out here on the frontier. Perhaps they had done the right thing in coming out here, and that perhaps someday in the not-too-distant future, they would recall this scene and so many scenes like it to the adoring wonder of their wives and children. Then, suddenly, as the men ride placidly up the banks of the river, a party of six to eight Blackfoot appear from around a bend, and all thoughts of love and legacy vanish for both men, now replaced with cold, sheer terror. The pair wheel their horses around and start into a full gallop headed back towards the company's camp. Then, to their horror, they see another group of Blackfoot coming towards them from where they had just ridden. Now, their only option to escape certain death is to make it to the other side of the Yellowstone River and hopefully outride their pursuers before they can cross the river themselves. With seconds to spare until the Blackfoot are upon them, the two desperate men lean back until their shoulders nearly touch the canters of their saddles as their mounts make the near vertical descent down the river banks into the water. As they do this, war cries from the Blackfoot fill the air, as do arrows from every bow present. As the trapper's horses hit the water, Green slides out of his saddle and swims alongside his horse, using the animal as a shield against the Blackfoot projectiles that rain down all around them. Howell, however, due either to inexperience, panic, or both, stays in his saddle, attempting to ride straight across and up the other bank. This is a fatal error. Before either trapper can make it to the opposite bank, Howell is struck three times in the back. Just as their horses begin to find their footing on the opposite bank, he gives a loud, piteous moan and falls forward onto the neck of his mount, dropping his rifle into the water. Are you badly hurt? cries Green, 
over the din of Blackfoot celebrations at falling one of their hated intruders. I'm a dead man, Howell says, and you had better leave me and do the best you can to save yourself. Green, to his eternal credit, decries this as an untenable option. He will not, he says, leave Howell to die so long as there is any hope of saving him. Green takes Howell's horse by the bridle, coaxing the animal up the embankment as the arrows continue to fly and Howell continues to moan and hang on with all of his might. Once they reach the top of the bank, Green tells Howell to bear down as he leads both horses as fast as possible in the direction of the camp. However, they are now on the opposite side of the river from the camp. Though they have secured some measure of a lead over their pursuers, they must again cross the river. They find a marshy area about a mile away from the camp that looks as though it might be fordable before the Blackfoot can reach them, and the men and horses plunge headlong into it in desperate flight. It is here that Howell, unable to hang on any longer, falls from his mount. Green sees he does not have time to load his direly wounded companion onto his own horse, nor can he mount any consequential resistance to the Blackfoot on his own. Thus, he rides for the camp at full speed, alerting his comrades as to the state and location of the fallen Howell. A group of trappers return with him at once and manage to load their suffering cohort onto another horse, all while amassing fire at the Blackfoot. They ride hard and fast back into camp, and Howell is laid out and made as comfortable as possible. But nothing can be done for the man. Howell writhes and wheezes for an unbearably long time. Finally, the unfortunate young man, along with all of his hopes for love and longevity, dies a cold, lonely death many miles from anything and anyone he truly loves. For all the vaunted talk of adventure and fortune, this is the stark reality of the frontier. Hal will be buried where he dies, and once the initial waves of horror and grief pass over the men in camp, a veil of rage descends upon them. Though the story of Howell will end here, the trappers present will go on to mount a revenge raid against the Blackfoot. It will be an attack the Blackfoot will never forget. But for now, that is another story for another time. Thank you for tuning into this episode. Don't forget to click like, share, and subscribe. Leave us a comment below, and if you'd like to support our work, consider becoming a member on Patreon. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, History Too Real for the Westerns.